Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study here at the Burning Church of Christ. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for taking the time to come and be with us as we study another part of God's Word. Be sure to get your Bible out, maybe pad and pencil as well as we go through our study tonight. We're going to be studying the book of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Not all tonight, but one chapter a week. We'll be studying that, about 13 chapters. and We'll try to cover one chapter a week as we go through this particular study. Just to let you know, we're here tonight. Not long in the future, we're going to be going uh, live on the uh, internet. It'll be recorded live at the building. So therefore, you'll be able to tune in. I get more information about that as we get closer. But you'll be able to tune in and see everything happening live at the building. There's an auditorium as we have the classes there, both Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. We'll be able to do live at all our services. Looking forward to that. I know you are as well as we have this time to even study even more. Okay, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And it's here in chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul starts out. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Uh, Paul here is addressing the letter to Timothy. Uh, he, he looks at Timothy as being maybe one of his converts. We don't know that for certain, that Paul was one that converted Timothy or not. But Paul was one that thought a lot of Timothy. In verse 2, as we'll look at in a minute, he called him the son of the faith. He was a young man that had a lot of faith about him. He had a lot of uh, uh, boldness about him, wanting to go out and to teach truth. And Paul recognizes that. And Paul uses Timothy many ways when it comes to teaching the gospel to, that, to the places where he would go. One thing that Paul has to do many times throughout the scriptures, we'll find him, especially right here, he has to try to reassure people that he is an apostle. He was an apostle. Now, we had no problem with that, about his conversion. But back in the days of Paul, there were those who doubted him, and he was always having to show, I'm an apostle. I was one that was given this by Christ himself, a commandment of God. Because there were many individuals who were afraid of Paul. He was a persecutor there for many years, trying to stop this Christian movement. But after his conversion, there were still those that had doubt. Why weren't you with the 12 apostles? Why weren't you with Christ then when he was on the earth? And Paul, several times in the scriptures, is showing to the people who are, he is speaking to or writing to, I am an apostle by the command of God. So he understood that. He was one born out of due season. We find that in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8. Born out of due season, due time. Paul knew that. Therefore, he was always trying to show to others that he was certainly an apostle, just like the other 12 as well. So Paul is doing that in verse 1. He's defending his apostleship. Now we go to verse 2. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's where Paul calls him the true son in the faith. Again, we don't know if Paul converted Timothy or not, but he certainly understood the value that Timothy was when it came to the ministry. Timothy was either from Derby or Lystra. we do not not sure which town he was from. We find in Acts 16 and verse 1 where Paul was in Lystra, and while he was there, he was stoned. Uh, the people got enough of him. Uh, they wanted to kill him. They took him outside the walls of the city, and there they stoned him, and they left him for dead. Now, some think that Paul really was dead and Christ brought him back to life. That could be a possibility. Or it was that Paul was just severely unconscious. And by doing that, after everybody left, then he sort of regained his consciousness. But he went that night and he stayed there uh, in Lystra, probably with some Christian friends he was staying. And we find that among individuals that he may have stayed with would be Timothy's mother and his grandmother. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5, we find that where I just told about his grandmother, how they had such a great faith. So it could be that that's where Paul was staying. Now, when Timothy chose to go with Paul on that second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, it was there I wondered, did it ever cross Timothy's mind, this may cost me my life? If he was there and 
and Derby, I mean Lystra, when Paul was stoned, did he witness these things and did he think for himself, you know, that could be me one day? What about his mother? What about his grandmother? What were their thoughts about Timothy going with Paul on the second missionary journey? Do they have some doubts about it as well? Well, we don't know. But what we do know, Timothy being a young man, he had the courage and he had the boldness to go with Paul, and he did, and he was a great help to Paul. Whenever Paul would need his help, need his assistance, he was there teaching as well and learning from the Apostle Paul also. So here we find Timothy, and here God, uh, here uh, Paul says to Timothy, I wish you the, the grace, mercy, and peace of God. What greater things could one ever wish upon someone else? Pray about for someone else. Mercy, grace, and peace from God. Well, that's what Paul wanted Timothy to have. So there's verse 2. Now, verse 3 and 4. As I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. So here we have Paul giving Timothy instructions. He says, while you're in Ephesus, I want you to teach no other doctrine than what you've heard from me, what you know to be taught. Again, we see here there must have been some false doctrine going around in Ephesus. And Paul is sending Timothy there to help straighten this up. And one thing that they seem to be teaching in Ephesus were fables and genealogies. What is a fable? Well, it's something that may have a little truth to it. It may not have truth to it. And Paul gives warning about that. Uh, be careful of that. Genealogies, they can just go on and on and on, and he gives warning about that. He says, don't worry about the fables and the genealogies. I want you to go about and teach doctrine. That's what you are to teach. Now, in today's society, religious society, uh, that's not a good thing. People don't want to hear doctrine because they look at doctrine and they see it as something that is divisive, something that separates us. So therefore, they want to lay all doctrine aside and let's just focus on the things that we have in common. Let's talk about Jesus. We talk about his love, grace, and mercy, but they don't want to talk about doctrine. But you see here what we just read. Paul told Timothy, you talk about doctrine. That's very important to do that. So you talk about doctrine. The church, that is the pillar and ground of the truth. Oh, and over, we'll see next, uh, next couple of weeks in 1 Timothy 3.15. That's what uh, Paul speaks about the church, the pillar and ground of the truth. If the church doesn't teach the truth, doesn't teach that which doctrine is required that we are to follow, then who is? Well, no one will. The church has that responsibility to be the pillar and ground of the truth. But what about these fables? They were just myths. They were just uh, things that could be, could not be proven or maybe they could be proven. Uh, not a whole lot to them. And Paul gives warning, don't get stuck on these things. Stay with the things that you know are right, the things that are correct. You know, sometimes today when we have a Bible study, it may be that we go to a history book and we can read of things that were happening in that area or that city, things we can read history about. Well, that's good to have. But we got to understand that that's just history. It's not inspired by God, but it is just history. I know often when, I, when I'm teaching a class and I bring in some history to that class, I'll tell them that this is history. This is what man says, and it's not God. But it may help us to understand a few things about what is taking place when that writing of Scripture happened. So here we find fables, and, and Paul says, beware of those. Uh, they're not going to do anything but be divisive. He talks about genealogies there. Uh, genealogy is a good thing. Uh, many people are into that. They like to search out their family history, see how far back the thing, they can go. Where did they come from? Who is the great-great-great-grandparents? And, and those things can be quite interesting. But what Paul is meaning here in these genealogies, you might have an individual who may trace their lineage back to who knows what faithful Christian or maybe some Old Testament prophet or somebody. And they may say, well, look how special I am. I'm special because of my genealogy. 
So Paul is saying, it doesn't matter who your, your dad or granddad or great granddad is. Those things don't matter. What matters is your faithfulness to God. Don't get caught up on these genealogies and on these fables. Again, those are things that can be very divisive. Again, we want things that can pull us together for the bettering, for the education, for edification of one another. And that's what Paul says there in verse 4. So there's warning that he gives to Timothy in verses 3 and 4. Now, verses 5 through 7. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor things which they affirm. Here talking about true doctrine. He says, you be careful that you don't get off here and stray from the faith. You don't begin to teach things that you know nothing about. Again, here he is giving warning. And that seems to be the case there in Ephesus as Paul is writing to Timothy. There are individuals that were doing that. Going out here and teaching things, they had no idea of what they were saying. And trying to affirm things that they had no idea what it taught. Paul says to Timothy, you go in there and you teach the truth and you set it straight. And you show them what real truth is and explain, them, explain that to them. If you go down the road of false doctrine, well, you're going to have a problem. You're going to stray from the faith. And that sort of uh, shows us that that doctrine of once saved, always saved, isn't correct. Because here, Paul is giving warning, don't stray away. Don't go away. And he brings it up a little later as well. But here in particular, he says, be careful and don't stray. So when it comes to the truth, Paul is saying, teach the truth Show individuals what it's really about. Now, verses 8 through 11. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Here, talking about the law, either both Old and New Testament, we see here, Paul said it's good. It's good for us to know these things, to know what is right and what is wrong. Because we need to stay away from that which is wrong. Because it will do us no good and it will cost us our salvation. So he gives a listing here of certain, all these sins here, he says you need to stay away from. Instead of going out here and teaching fables and genealogies, he said, why don't you teach sin? Why don't you address it, what it is and what it will do? Again, again that's something today that people don't like. Don't talk to me about sin. I want to do what I want to do. Don't tell me all these things are wrong. It's my choice. It's my life, my soul. Well, it is their choice. It is their life. It is their soul. But still, as Christians, God has given to us the responsibility of warning individuals about these sins, really any sin. It is our responsibility to do so. We can't be ashamed of the gospel. The Apostle Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. Romans 1 and verse 16 tells us that. And he's telling Timothy the same thing here. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. When it comes to truth, you teach it. You show where sin is wrong and stay away from these fables and genealogies. You stay focused on the truth. So we find that in, in 8 through 11. Now, verses 12 and 13. First Timothy 1, 12 and 13. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul now shows here, the Lord counted me faithful. 
He said, look at old Paul there. He can certainly do a good job in the church. And Paul is thankful that Christ chose him. Christ did. They're on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. That's where the Lord appeared to Paul. And, and there he may gave him the choice here. Going to Damascus, there you'll be told what to do. Well, Paul did. He was told what to do to become a Christian. And from that day on, he never looked back. He knew he had a past. And he did have a past. Here the scriptures say that he was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was an insolent man. All these terrible things. But what about being a blasphemer? The next time you hear somebody say, that's the unpardonable sin, you might want to reference them right here to Paul's situation. Paul said, I was a blasphemer. That meaning is behind him. He was forgiven of that. A blasphemer can be forgiven if they would turn from their way. But if they continue to reject God and Christ and the word of God itself, well, then there's no saving them. There's no other way out there to save that individual. So a blasphemer, if he blasphemes all that God has done to save him, well, then he cannot be saved unless there's repentance. Well, Paul says here, I was formerly a blasphemer. He got forgiveness for that. He was a persecutor. He would go into the homes of individuals and he would drag out both men and women, mom and dad, drag them out, beat them, put them in jail, prison, Maybe had a few of them killed because of being Christians. He was a persecutor. He was a top-of-the-line persecutor. He was an insolent man. He loved doing this. He loved going after these Christians, trying to put a stop to this thing called Christianity. Was he successful? Well, no, he didn't stop it. Really what he did, he would cause Christians to scatter, and as they scattered, they were where they would go. There they would teach the truth. But Paul was a pretty rough individual. In Acts chapter 8, we find where he was dragging the men and women from their homes. In Acts chapter 9, he was on the road to Damascus there to do persecution whenever the Lord appeared to him. In Acts chapter 26, he said there that he voted toward the death of Christians, and he wanted them dead. Oh, he was the top when it came to individuals that were hating Christ and hated the way of Christianity. But he changed. And he's trying to get it across to those listening here and to Timothy that the Lord can save me. If the Lord can use me, he can use you. He can also save you. Again, that's Paul's message of encouragement there. He's trying to get across. He has a great message that we can be saved as well. And then look at what he says in verses 14 through 15. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul had a special title. He saw himself as being the chief of sinners. I mean at the very top. And he was. He went out here and a blasphemer, a persecutor. He loved doing these things. Who knows how much damage he did. When he said, I'm the chief of sinners, I believe him. He was. He did a lot of terrible things. But yet he is saying that here to show if God can save me, he can save you. Do we consider ourselves to be the chief of sinners? Well, most of the time, we always think, well, there's somebody out there a little worse than me. Well, Paul is saying here, no, I'm the top of the line here. There's no one any, any worse than I am. And yet, Christ saved me. If he can save Paul, he can save us as well. He, his grace is abundant. You'll never run, Christ, God will never run out of grace. They will always have plenty available to go and to give to where and when it is needed. So there Paul is trying to get across to us. He is the chief of sinners. He certainly is. If he can be saved, so can we. Now we go to verse 16 and 17. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the God who alone is wise, be honor and glory 
forever and ever. The worst of sinners? Oh, yeah. And yet God saved him. It is here that God gave him something he did not deserve. That was mercy. God gave him these things. And because of this, he can be saved. And he's given God the praise. Look at all that God has done for me. And if he would do this for me, the chief of sinners, look what he'll do for you. Again, he, we have that assurance that God will be with us forever. And then we come to verses 18 through 20. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage to good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected, concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I deliver to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. He speaks here of Timothy concerning the prophecies. He says, the prophecies concerning you. Well, as far as I know, Timothy was never mentioned in any Old Testament prophecy. But what was mentioned is how these men will be given uh, miraculous abilities to go out and to do many great, wonderful works in the name of the Lord, showing that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. That's what I think Paul is speaking of here to Timothy. You were given these miraculous abilities that were spoken of by the prophets of old. Now go and use them. If you jump ahead in 1 Timothy 4, verse 15, Paul speaks of the gift that Timothy has. And Timothy certainly had uh, these gifts. But also we see here, these are to be used to fight a good war. A good war out there, a great battle. Every Christian is, is in a battle. We're battling Satan, we're battling sin, we're trying to do what which is good. We're in that battle. And he's encouraging Timothy here to keep that up to keep that good battle up. Use the, the weapons that the Lord has given to you to fight this good battle. Make sure, though, you don't do like Hymenaeus and Alexander and have your face shipwrecked and go back into the, into the world. We don't know much about these individuals, mainly only their names. They're mentioned elsewhere in the scriptures, but we don't know what they did to go back and, into the world and shipwreck their faith if something happened. Maybe they got caught up in fables and genealogies. Well, we don't know. We don't know what happened to them, but we do know that Paul is warning Timothy, don't go in that direction. He speaks here of what happened here, how he delivered them over to Satan. Well, that phrase is also used in First. I mean, uh, it's also used in First Corinthians chapter five, where the man there who committed fornication with his father's wife. Well, Paul also said there, I'm going to deliver you over to Satan. What that simply means is, is church discipline. He was delivering them over to, to these uh, church discipline to teach this man that what he was doing was wrong. Also, Emmaus and Alexander here, what they were doing was wrong. And hopefully when the church would discipline these individuals, they would see the truth and realize the love that God has for them and repent of their ways and come back. And that's simply what is taking place here as they're being delivered to Satan. Again, they had, they wouldn't be the ones that would need to change and would need to repent and come back here to the Lord. So here's something we see, another few verses here that show us that that doctrine of once saved, always saved. Well, that's not true because here's here are two disciples, two Christians that went away. They shipwrecked their faith for believing something, teaching something that was not approved here by the Apostle Paul or by Christ himself. Okay, there's chapter one. Uh, next week, we'll cover chapter two. And uh, hopefully something has been said this evening to help us to better understand what Paul is having laying out here for Timothy to understand and carry to the church of Ephesus and teach them. Thank you for being with us today. Be sure at the end of our program, uh, view those who are on our sick list and need our prayers. Be sure to be praying for them, about them, and, and those who are caring for them. You can also go to our webpage and, and find other additional information there. Hopefully you'll do that as well. If anything we can do to help you, our phone number's there at the bottom of the page. Give us a call, 
and we'll get back with you as soon as possible. Again, if you can, be with us at the church building tonight at 7 o'clock. We're meeting there in person. Also, Sunday morning, uh, either at 9.30 or 10.45. And remember, we're meeting on Sunday night now at 5 o'clock. And soon, uh, the first Sunday in April, we're going to come back together on Sunday morning with one service beginning at 10.30. Hope you can be with us. Until next time, may God bless. May you have a great week. And may we close with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the day you've given to us and the blessings of life. And, and thank you so much for the Bible we can study and learn from your word. Help us, Lord, as we study these lessons. We'll come more knowledgeable. That will help us to have more faith and more love toward you and toward each other. Again, be with our sick and watch over them. And be with us in our time of need, wherever they may be. Be help us now always. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.